would like to share some of the Book of Joy with you all. I've been reading it recently and it's got some amazing messages in it. Um, a conversation between His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. And um, I was reading a chapter looking into the benefits that we can gain from going through adversities. And I thought, I need to read this out to all of you because and share it because there's just so many people that I talk to that are struggling in their different ways for different reasons and I I think something really big is happening there's big growth happening big changes happening and if we can use this time for for growing and becoming stronger and more united and taking down walls and building bridges, then then it's all worthwhile. And maybe some words of wisdom from the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu can help in this. So um, it's a conversation that takes place between them. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you the introductory page and then gonna, I'm going to skip straight on to the chapter about adversity. And if you enjoy it, then I'll read the other chapters. So, this is a lovely picture of the two of them together. The Invitation to Joy To celebrate one of our special birthdays, we met for a week in Dharamasala, India, to enjoy our friendship and to create something that we hope will be a birthday gift for others. There is perhaps nothing more joyful than birth, and yet so much of life is spent in sadness, stress and suffering. We hope this small book will be an invitation for more joy and more happiness. No dark fate determines our future. We do. Each day and each moment we are able to create and recreate our lives and the very quality of human life on our planet. This is the power we wield. Lasting happiness cannot be found in pursuit of any goal or achievement. It does not reside in fortune or fame. It resides only in the human mind and heart. And it is here that we hope you will find it. Our co-writer, Douglas Abrams, has kindly agreed to assist us in this project and interviewed us over the course of a week in Dharamasala. We have, added, we have asked him to weave our voices together and offer his as our narrator so that we can share not only our views and experiences but also what scientists and others have found to be the wellspring of joy. You don't need to believe us. Indeed, nothing we say should be taken as an article of faith. We are sharing what two friends from very different worlds have witnessed and learned in our own lives. We hope you will discover whether what is included here is true by applying it in your own life. Every day is a new opportunity to begin again. Every day is your birthday. May this book be a blessing for all sentient beings and for all of God's children, including you. Are you sitting comfortably? Yeah? Good. Then I'll begin. Suffering and adversity, passing through difficulties. There is a Tibetan saying that adversities can turn into good opportunities, the Dalai Lama explained in response to my question about how it is possible to experience even at time, to experience joy even at times of suffering and adversity. Even a tragic situation can become an opportunity. There is another Tibetan saying that it is actually the painful experiences that shine the light on the nature of happiness. They do this by bringing joyful experiences into sharp relief. You can see this in an entire generation 
that has experienced difficulties, like you, Archbishop, the Dalai Lama said. When you got your freedom, you really felt joyful. Now the new generation, who are born after, they don't know the true joy of freedom and complain more. I remember seeing the lines of people who had waited for hours and hours to vote in the first democratic election in South Africa in 1994. The lines snaked on for miles. I remembered wondering at the time as the US voter turnout was hovering over under 40%, how long that sense of joy and appreciation for the right to vote would last and whether there was any way to revive it. In America, among those who had never been denied the right to vote, I think in Europe too, the Dalai Lama continued, the older generation really went through great hardship. They were hardened and strengthened by those painful experiences. So this shows that the Tibetan saying is really true. The suffering is what makes you appreciate the joy. As the Dalai Lama was speaking, I could not help thinking of how we try so hard with our natural parental instincts to save our children from pain and suffering. But when we do, we rob them of their ability to grow and learn from adversity. I recalled psycho psychologists and... Auschwitz survivor Edith Eva Egger saying that the spoiled pampered children were the first to die at Auschwitz. They kept waiting for others to come and save them and when no one came they gave up. They had not learnt how to save themselves. Many people think of suffering as a problem the Dalai Lama said. Actually it is an opportunity destiny has given you. In spite of difficulties and suffering, you can remain firm and maintain your composure. I understood what the Dalai Lama was saying, but how do we actually embrace our suffering and see it as an opportunity while we are in the middle of it? Certainly this was easier said than done. Jimpa, that's the Dalai Lama's translator I believe, had mentioned that the Tibetan spiritual teaching known as the seven point mind training, three categories of people are identified as being special objects of focus because these are the most challenging. Your family members, your teachers and your enemies. Three objects, three poisons, three roots of virtue. Jimpa explained the meaning of this cryptic and intriguing phrase. Often it is our day-to-day -day interaction with these three objects that give rise to the three poisons of attachment, anger and delusion, which are, the heart, are at the heart of so much suffering. Through spiritual training we have the opportunity to transform our engagement with our family, teachers and adversities into the development of the three root virtues, non-attachment, compassion and wisdom. Many Tibetans, the Dalai Lama said, spent years in Chinese gulags, work camps, where they were tortured and forced to do hard labour. This, some of them told me, was a good time to test the real person and their inner strength. Some lost hope, some kept going. Education had very little to do with who survived. In the end, it was their inner spirit or warm-heartedness that made the real difference. I had expected the Dalai Lama to say it was their fierce resolve and determination that had made the difference. It was fascinating to hear that it was what he called inner spirit or warm-heartedness that had allowed some to endure the hardships of the gulags. The Archbishop now responded to the Dalai Lama with a question, echoing the one I had asked at the beginning of our discussion. We had been clear from the beginning that this book was to 
was to be about joy in the face of life's inevitable suffering and not some abstract or inspirational theory of joy. We wanted readers to know how much to maintain joy at the most we wanted readers to know know how to maintain joy at the most trying moments of our lives, not just when all is well, to quote the Archbishop Hunkidoriness. He is asking how do we help people who really want to be joyful, who really want to see the world become a better place? They look at the world and they see the horrendous problems there are, and they face quite extraordinary adversities in their own lives. Why are you joyful even when you see these problems and have faced such challenges? There are very, very many people in the world who do want to be good, who want to be joyful, who want to be like you. I mean, how do they get to have this calm in the midst of it all? And yes, I think that you are the most eloquent, and I think that you are the most eloquent statement, but they want us now to translate that statement into language that they can understand. And then, as if inspired to answer his own question, the Archbishop continued, This is what we want to tell them. We say that you will be surprised by the joy the, minute, the minute you stop being too self-regarding. Self of course you have to be somewhat self-regarding, because the joy that I follow, the joy that I follow, said taking it from the scriptures love thy neighbour as you the Dalai Lama said finishing the famous teachings yes the archbishop said thyself love thy neighbour as thyself love others as you love yourself yes yes the Dalai Lama was nodding his head in agreement the Archbishop translated the scripture into contemporary phrasing. You must long for the best for others as you would want the best for you. That's right, the Dalai Lama said. They look on you and they see you as a wonderful guru or a teacher. And not just a teacher, but an embodiment. And they long to be able to have the same calm and joy, even when they have all the many, many frustrations like you have encountered. This, I think, merits discussion, the Dalai Lama said. You see, in reality, like our physical body, we're, where growth takes time, our mental development also takes time. Minute by minute, day by day, month by month, year by year, decade by decade, perhaps... I will share a story from my own life. When I was 16, I lost my freedom. In two senses. The previous Dalai Lama had not taken on political responsibility until he was 18. But in my case, the people asked me to become head of the government early because the situation was very serious. As the Chinese military had already invaded the eastern part of Tibet, when the Chinese authorities reached Lhasa, things became even more delicate, and I lost my freedom in a second way, as they severely restricted my actions. This political responsibility also greatly damaged my studies. As I carried out my Geshe examinations at the major monastic universities around Lhasa in central Tibet, the Tibetan soldiers had to stand guard on the mountainside nearby. Then my final examination was to be in the courtyard of the central temple in Lhasa. There were some worries about the Chinese military, and some Tibetan officials wanted to change the location, because they thought it was too dangerous. But I said I did not think it was necessary. But during the debate, I had a lot of anxiety and worry, not just for my safety, but also for that of my people. 
For then, at the age of 24, when I escaped to India in March 1959, I lost my own country. In one way, this made me very sad, particularly when I think of the serious question of whether the Tibetan nation, with its unique cultural heritage, will actually survive or not. The Tibetan civilization has existed for 10,000 years, and in some areas of the Tibetan plateau, human habitation existed for many, for as many as 30,000 years. And today's situation of Tibet is the most serious crisis in the entire history of the nation. During the Cultural Revolution, some Chinese officials made a pledge that within 15 years the Tibetan language must be eliminated. So they burned books such as the 300 volume Tibetan canon of scriptures translated from India, as well as several thousand volumes written by Tibetans themselves. I was told that the books would burn for one, for one or two weeks. Our statues and our monasteries were being destroyed, so it was a very, very serious situation. And when we came to India as refugees in 1959, we were strangers in a new place. As the Tibetan saying goes, the only things that were familiar to us were the sky and the earth. But we received immense help from the Indian government and some international organisations, including some Christian organisations who rebuilt the Tibetan community so that we could keep our culture and language and our knowledge alive. So a lot of difficulties, a lot of problems, but when you carry out the work and the more difficulties you encounter, then when you see some results, the greater the joy, isn't it? The Dalai Lama is now turning to the Archbishop for confirmation. Yes, the Archbishop said still clearly moved by the suffering the Dalai Lama had encountered. You see, if there are no difficulties and you are always relaxed, then you can play more. The Dalai Lama said, now laughing at the irony that we could experience more joy in the face of great adversity than when life is seemingly easy and uneventful. The Archbishop was laughing too. Joy, it seemed, was a strange alchemy of mind over matter. The path to joy, like with sadness, did not lead away from suffering and adversity, but through it. As the Archbishop had said, nothing beautiful comes without some suffering. Jimpa shared how the Dalai Lama often viewed his exile as an opportunity. His Holiness often says, that when you become a refugee, you get closer to life, Jimpa said, speaking no doubt from his own experience as well, because there is no room for pretense. In this way, you get closer to the truth. Archbishop, I said, maybe we could turn to you for a moment. The Dalai Lama is saying that you actually feel more joy after you've succeeded in the face of um, opposition. I stopped as I saw the Archbishop gazing at the Dalai Lama with a sense of amazement. I'm really actually very humbled listening to His Holiness, the Archbishop said, because I frequently mention to people the fact of his serenity and his calm and joyfulness. He would probably have said, in spite of, we would probably have said, in spite of, the adversity, but it seems like he's saying because of the adversity that this has evolved for him. The Archbishop was holding the Dalai Lama's hand, patting and rubbing his palm affectionately. It just increases my own personal admiration for him. It almost seems perverse but one wants to say, thank goodness that the Chinese invaded Tibet. Yes, because I don't think we would have the same contact. We certainly would not have the same friendship. 
and then seeing the ironic humour in history, the Archbishop started to cackle. You probably would not have got a Nobel Priest Prize. The Dalai Lama was now laughing as they poked fun at these esteemed prizes, as if to say that we can never know what in the end will come of our suffering and adversity, what is good and what is bad. Certainly he was not saying that the Peace Prize or their friendship would somehow justify the suffering of millions that the Chinese invasion had caused, but in a bizarre way, perverse really, as the Archbishop had said, the Dalai Lama would never have become a global spiritual leader without being chased out of his cloistered kingdom. It reminded one of the famous Chinese story about the farmer whose horse runs away. His neighbours are quick to comment on his bad luck. The farmer responds, That's that no one can know what is good and what is bad. When the horse came back with a wild stallion, the neighbours are quick to comment this time talking about the farmer's good luck. Again the farmer replies that no one can know what is good and what is bad. When the farmer's son breaks his leg trying to tame the wild stallion, the neighbours now are certain of the farmer's bad luck. Again the farmer says that no one knows what no one knows what is good and what is bad. When war breaks out, all the able-bodied young men are conscripted into battle, except the farmer's son, who is spared because of his broken leg. See? No one knows. But to come to your question, the Archbishop said, I was thinking, as the Dalai Lama was speaking, about something that was personal, although perhaps you could extrapolate it more generally. I'm thinking of Nelson Mandela. As, as we said, Nelson Mandela, when he went into prison, was a very angry young man, or youngish man. He was the commander-in-chief of the military wing of the ANC. As we, sa as we said, he believed firmly that the enemy had to be decimated, and he and his comrades had been found guilty in a travesty of justice. That is the guy who went in aggressive and angry. He comes onto Robin Island and is mistreated as most of them were. Today, when people go and they see his cell, there's a bed. They didn't, they didn't have a bed. They were sleeping on the floor, no mattress, just a thin little thing. The Archbishop was pinching his thumb and forefinger to emphasise the discomfort, the pain and the suffering that he endured, even in sleep. These were suffocated, educated people. <laughs> These were sophisticated, educated people. What do they do? What are they made to do? They are made to go and dig in a quarry and they are wearing very inadequate clothing. Nelson Mandela and all of them wore shorts, even in the winter. They were made to do almost senseless work, breaking rocks and sewing post office bags. He was a highly qualified lawyer. There he is, sitting and sewing. During a visit to Robben Island with Ahmed Kafrada, one of, the Man one of Mandela's colleagues and a fellow prisoner. He showed, us in the, he showed us in the cafeteria the different rations that were given to the prisoners based on their race, a daily reminder of the, of the obsessive racial fascism that they were fighting. Six ounces of meat for coloured Asiatics and five ounces for Bantus, blacks. One ounce of jam or syrup for coloured Asiatics, none for Bantus. I mean, it must have been, it must have frustrated him to no end. 
made him very, very angry. God was good and said, you're going to stay here 27 years. And after those 27 years, he emerges on the other side as someone of immense magnanimity, because in an extraordinary way, his suffering helped to grow him. Where they thought it was going to break him, it helped him. It helped him to see the point of view of the other. 27 years later, he comes out kind, caring, ready to trust his erstwhile, erstwhile enemy. So how did he do it? I asked. I mean, why do you think he was able to see his suffering as ennobling rather than embittering? He didn't see it. It happened. So why did it happen for him? Because for others it has not. Yes, of course. Some people it would embitter, the Archbishop had once explained to me that suffering can either embitter us or ennoble us and that the difference lies in whether we are able to find meaning in our suffering. Good point. Without meaning, when suffering seems sense without meaning when suffering seems senseless, we can easily become embittered. But when we can find a shred of meaning or redemption in our suffering, it can ennoble us ennoble us as it did for Nelson Mandela. One has learned in very many instances, he continued, that for us to grow in generosity of spirit, we have to undergo some way, in some way or other a diminishing of frustration, of frustration. You may not always think of it as being so. There are very few lives that just go that just move smoothly from beginning to end. They have to be refined. What is it that needs to be refined? Our almost natural response is when I am hit, I hit back. When you have been refined, you want to find out what it is that impelled this other one to do what they did. And so you put yourself into the shoes of the other. Mm. So it is almost an axiom that generosity of spirit seems to require that one will have had setbacks to remove the dross. Removing the dross, the Archbishop continued, and learning, yes, to put yourself in the shoes of the other, and it seems almost without fail that generosity of spirit requires that we will have experience if will have experience if not suffering then at least frustrations things that seem to want to stop us from moving in the particular direction that we have chosen you don't move easily straightforwardly like this there are things that force you off course and you have to come back. The Archbishop was gesturing with his delicate and frail left hand, which was paralysed by polio as a child, a vivid example of the suffering that he had experienced at a very young age. It is probably something like your muscle, he concluded. I mean... If you want a good muscle tone, you know, you work against it, offering it resistance, and it will grow. If you are limp, it won't grow. You can't expand the volume of your chest just by sitting. You have to walk up mountains. There's a measure of going against, as it were, your nature. Your natural longing is to want to sit still. But if you do that and become a sofa cabbage or a couch potato, it's going to show. So what is true physically is, in a wonderful way, true spiritually as well. Deep down we grow in kindness when our kindness is tested. Mm, I like that. 
absolutely, absolutely the Dalai Lama was agreeing, swaying back and forth from side to side, looking down thoughtfully, fingertips touching. This reminds me of my friend who told me about being sent to a Chinese gulag at the time I escaped from Tibet. The night I fled from the palace of Milbalinga, I went to a chapel to pay my respects, <coughs> knowing it was likely the last time I would ever see it again. My friend, who was already a senior monk at Namgyal Monastery, was there at the chapel, Loponla, as he is affectionately known by his fellow monks, did not know it was me because my visit was top secret and I could not tell him. Then, as soon as I had left the palace, the Chinese bombardment started. They arrested many people and about 130 were sent to a very remote area, like uh, during Stalin's rule when people were sent to Siberia. After 18 years of hard labour, Lopanla was able to come to India, and he told me what had happened during his time at the work camp. They had no shoes, even during the very coldest of days. Sometimes it was so cold that when you spit, it would land as ice. They were always hungry, one day he was so hungry he tried to eat the body of one of the other prisoners who had died, but the flesh on the dead person was frozen and too hard to bite. Throughout the whole time they tortured the prisoners. There is Soviet-style torture, Japanese-style torture and Chinese-style torture, and at this camp they combined them all into an immensely cruel kind of torture. When he left the camp, not when he left the camp, only twenty people had survived. He told me that during those eighteen years he faced some real dangers. I thought of course he was talking about dangers to his life. He told me he was in danger of losing his compassion for his Chinese guards. I could hear a gasp in the room at this extraordinary statement that the greatest danger for this man had been the risk of losing his compassion, losing his heart, losing his humility. Now he is still alive, aged 97, and his mind is still very in very good shape sharp and healthy. So as you mentioned, his spirituality and his experience reinforced his ability for compassion, his human qualities. There are a number of cases where Tibetans who spent many years in hard labour in Chinese gulags told me that it was their best periods for spiritual practice, for developing patience and compassion. One of my personal physicians, Dr. Tenzin Chodrak, who years later managed to come to India, was quite clever. In the gulag, he was, presented, he was prevented from having the rosary and was forced to read Chairman Mao's red book. So he used the syllables of the book as his rosary and recited Buddhist prayers. But in the eyes of the Chinese guards, he was very seriously studying Mao's books. So, like, a, like in Nelson Mandela's case, when you are imprisoned, as you, as you said, it's normal to experience great difficulties. But these experiences can, with the right way of thinking, lead you to have great inner strength. So I think that... This is something very useful, particularly when we are passing through difficulties. I was quite struck by the Dalai Lama's phrase of passing through difficulties. We often feel that suffering will engulf us or that the suffering will never end. But if we can realise that it too will pass, or as the Buddhists say, 
that it is impermanent, we can survive them more easily and perhaps appreciate what we have to learn from them, finding the meaning in them so that we can come out the other side, not embittered but ennobled. The depth of our suffering can also result in the height of our joy. Shantideva, the Buddhist monk and scholar, describes the virtues of suffering. Because of the shock suffering causes us, our arrogances fall away. Suffering also gives rise to compassion for all others who are suffering. And because of our experience of suffering, we avoid actions that will bring suffering to others. Noponla and Dr. Chodrak would have known these teachings by Shantidevi and may have clung to them during the years of hardship and seeming endless suffering, making meaning out of what must have been at times what must have at times felt like meaningless agony. The Dalai Lama and the Archbishop were emphasizing that some degree of tolerance and acceptance is essential as is realising that these sorrows happen to all people, not just to us, and not because we have done anything wrong. The year before our dialogue, my father fell down a flight of stairs and suffered a traumatic brain injury. The doctors explained that with a broken bone, we know exactly how long it will take to heal. But with the brain, we never know how it will heal, and if it will heal completely. For more than a month, he was in intensive care unit and neuro rehab. It's in varying states of delirium. As we worried whether we would ever return, whether he would ever return to his former self, to his great mind and heart. I never forget the, I'll never forget the first telephone call I received from him from the hospital. Since we did not know if he would ever be able to communicate consciously again. When my brother was visiting with my dad, he said, I'm so sorry you've had this terrible experience. My father replied, Oh no, oh no, not at all. It's all part of my curriculum. <laughs> wow. It's really touching. Yeah, I, um, it's so hard at times when everything's feels so difficult to be able to put into practice some of these things but it's really it feels it it feels really true that in times of difficulties if we can see that they're not they're not going to last that they are changing and moving and that they are opportunities and that opportunity won't always be here so to grasp the opportunity while it's here and and even if the steps that we take are small, even if they're stumbling, if we if we take them steps and towards learning from whatever it is that life throws at us, I think it can be only it can only be a positive thing. So I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, it's definitely been food for thought for me. And if you'd like me to read some more chapters of this book, just send me a message and let me know that you like it and I'll read. I'm, I'm not always the most confident reader, um, but I, I love being able to share messages that I think will help people. And I think this book's full of some great nuggets. And I think at the moment, some of these nuggets can really help us get through. I hope wherever you are at the moment, 
that you're doing okay and that you've got all that you need to get through and I'm often amazed how much stronger we are than we realise we are and how just when we need it we get the help that we need so keep in, hanging on in there and write to me if you'd like to hear more or just want to be in contact. Take care. Bye for now.